algorithm of the control panel. As the time allows, uh, the presenters will address as many questions as they can uh, during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Uh, comme vous l'avez entendu, ce webinaire uh, uh, sera mis en, à votre disposition après, uh, après l'événement et sera, uh, sera disponible sur le site uh, de Nano Canada. So I'm very, very pleased to, uh, to introduce Mark Thiel, who is a senior policy advisor at WorkSafe BC's Policy, Regulation, and Research Division, and he currently chairs WorkSafe BC's Exposure Limit Review Committee. He has over 20 years of experience in academic, regulatory, industrial research, uh, and work environments in nanotechnology and occupational health and safety. Uh, this includes being the Occupational Hygiene Officer at WorkSafe BC Prevention Field Services for over nine years. Mark obtained his BSc and PhD in chemistry at the University of British Columbia. He also has integrated hands-on experience in synthesizing and characterizing engineered nanomaterials for industrial applications, including surface coatings, thin films, and fuel cells. Uh, Mark is an active member of the CSA Nanotechnology Occupational Health and Safety Technical Committee and the Vice Chair of the Canadian Mirror Committee for ISO TC229 Nanotechnologies Joint Working Group 1. Uh, Mark currently sits on review and steering committees on a number of research groups involving, involved in nanotechnology and developing analytical sampling methods. He's also a committee member of the Canadian Safety and Health Initiative for Nanotechnology and Advanced Materials and has put this incredible seminar together for us today. Thank you, Mark. I'll leave it hey. over to you. Okay, thank you, Mary. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. S uh, Scott Brown, who is a senior principal scientist in the Kingworks Company, where he leads the Particle Science and Characterization Laboratory. Scott also serves as the vice chair for the business at the OECD Nanotechnology Expert Group. Uh, he's also the convener of the liaison committee for ISO TC229 and joint working group one chair for the ANSI accredited US tag to ISO TC229. Dr. Brown has a PhD in material science and engineering from the University of Florida. So it's my pleasure to invite Scott to share with us his talk, Applying Standards in Industry. Thank you, Mark. It's my pleasure being here today. And hold on one second, sorry. <clears throat> it's my pleasure being here today. And it's quite an honor to be able to kick off this webinar series with my perspectives on applying standards in industry and how to get the most out of health and safety standards dealing with nanotechnologies. So in industry, there are many different types of standards that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I like to think about standards as tools. And as with tools, each tool has its own uh, purpose and use. And so when we think about standards in industry, there are internal standards that are typically uh, developed or honed within an organization for ensuring the day-to-day -day, uh, consistency and quality within that organization. It could be something as simple as administrative processes for laboratory safety documentation, and auditing, or it could be naming conventions. So what do you call a certain process or a product that comes from a, a certain process uh, within uh, a, a, a technique? Um, then there are the uh, standards that are, are used as tools for communication uh, between organizations. And these are the ones that, that uh, many of the talks today will be focusing on. Uh, these can be voluntary standards that are developed by multiple organizations to talk about comparability of data, performance, what we call things. And these are usually to facilitate trade and commerce. Um, and then there, these could also be uh, uh, standards that are developed to ensure regulatory compliance. Uh, <clears throat> these types of standards are, are essential for business because they allow you to conduct business in a responsible manner, as well as ensure that uh, your products and services are communicated to others in an appropriate and, and consistent fashion. Um, regulatory standards are, are very similar to the voluntary standards that are being developed by organizations in that often they uh, are lean heavily towards 
uh, the standards that are developed by organizations like ISO, ASTM, and others, because uh, regulatory standards have a slightly uh, different uh, flavor to them in that they're honed for a particular uh, regulatory uh, purpose uh, that <clears throat> requires them to be adjusted. But again, they, they lean heavily on uh, existing voluntary standards. So there, in a sense, there's a, an ecosystem of different types of standards that are used in, in industry and they're used for, for different purposes. So it might just be for within uh, an organization for, for instance, for your internal standards, but importantly, voluntary and regulatory standards allow you to communicate across organizations, and, and these are, are really essential. Um, when we talk about uh, standards and their use in industry, there's a number of different reasons for their use. Uh, and a, a number of these were mentioned on the previous slide, but terminology and what we call things is, is really essential, as well as how do we measure what we have and, and how do we define the specifications for a material substance or even a, a service? And then how do we ensure regulatory compliance? And these are all very important for uh, conducting business. And ideally, um, the standards that we use in one region of the world would also be the same in another. And, and a big uh, <clears throat> incentive for industry to look towards an international standards and consistency amongst international standards is to really save costs and resources when ensuring that products are manufactured safely, uh, that provide the, um, the usage and the functionality um, that are required and, and that abide by regulations. And, and so um, the efforts of the International Organization of Standardization and the efforts of the OECD go a long ways towards uh, ensuring that um, business can be conducted across the world in, in a very cost-effective manner. Uh, in particular, the OECD has a mutual acceptance of data um, provisions where their test guidelines, for instance, for looking at the toxicology of nanomaterials can be um, used uh, by an organization. And if, and if you abide by those test guidelines, that data uh, will be accepted by the uh, member countries to the OECD, which you know, for chemicals has saved millions of dollars uh, you know, with reduced costs for testing. And, and as uh, folks on, on the call that are from industry will know that testing is, is a huge cost in, in ensuring um, your products are, are, are safe. So what happens when um, there are not uh, standards. Well, uh, this, this picture is really uh, here in jest, but, but certainly you, you can see what uh, could happen if, if standards are not in place. So could you imagine if an inch was not an inch uh, or if uh, a pressure relief valve didn't uh, relieve pressure at a, at a, at a constant um, point, uh, a lot of uh, issues could arise and, and that's in terms of uh, commerce as well as in terms of safety. And so having uh, consistent and good standards is, is really essential for uh, the conduction of business. Um, standards also uh, help uh, you know, ensure consistency and the consistency is very valuable to business. So you can't sell or trade a product if uh, you, there's no, um, assurance that that product will be the same uh, time and time over again. So standards help uh, establish uh, methods to ensure product quality, uh, also ensure product safety, whether uh, for the product itself or in the, in the way that the product is produced or the, the worker, the safety of the worker environment. Uh, good standards are, are well recognized. You can see uh, that there are several of these uh, ISO series that, that may be known to you. Uh, simply because uh, a number of organizations use them to ensure that, that others understand their commitment to uh, quality, to safety, and, and so on. Um, and, and even things that might seem mundane or, or simple, like uh, the use of metric units, are, are very important standards that uh, we apply daily in our lives and, and are essential for 
uh, growing uh, technologies and technology landscapes like nanotechnologies. So uh, with that though, the, there has to be the understanding that um, over standardization can cause uh, some issues and, and so can under standardization. So if for instance, your USB plug that you use on a daily basis uh, would also plug into the, the 120 or 210 uh, volts AC in, in your wall, that, that might have uh, some uh, adverse consequences to the electronic devices that they may be attached to. So um, there's, there's a need to balance um, standardization in, in, in all areas, including the technologies, so that they enable both um, the development of, of new technologies and competition, as well as uh, allow for the, uh, the creation of, of the market space. So having um, the same sort of plug allows for uh, you know, markets to grow uh, while uh, having some variation in the types of plugs allow for different types of competition as well. So striking the right balance is, is not that easy. And um, the key thing here is that standards, just like any other tool, need to be fit for purpose. And in order to, to move forward in nanotechnologies, we need to have uh, several different types of standards uh, that are fit for purpose. Forgive me for my, uh, for my slide advancement. So the value of a common language, uh, as I mentioned, is, is very essential and you'll be hearing more about this today. Uh, this is perhaps you know, the most fundamental of all the different types of standards that, that we have and, and it relates back to communicating. Uh, even today, when we think about uh, things that might appear to be simple, uh, you know, what one word means to one community is still very different to that of another. And so ensuring that for uh, in the area of nanotechnologies and nanosafety that we understand what we mean when we say certain things is, is really key. Um, and this is also key for developing the methods that will also use this terminology. So it's important to understand that um, not individual standards don't uh, stand alone, but rather they stand within a collection and understanding how they interact is, is very important. And, and without these, uh, it makes it very hard uh, to, uh, to trade commerce and also ensure safety of, of, of materials. So this is just an example of the importance of context in terms of, of something rather simple, but, but really it's not that simple as, as terminology. So if you look at the definition of particle uh, from different um, standards or organizations, you'll see that there can be very different definitions out there. And it's important to understand where the definition came from in the context, because context tells you whether or not it might be fit for purpose. Or in, in terms of uh, terminology related to the health and safety of nanomaterials and nanotechnologies, ISO TC229 is, is one of the, the, the key resources that's recognized by uh, a number of jurisdictions around the world. And so, uh, just for this example, for, for looking at, at different ISO definitions, you can see that, that within the space systems and operations, their definition is not as precise as the one in um, ISO TC229, and fine ceramics is also very different as well. So keeping uh, focus on uh, what's the purpose of, of the uh, standardizing body and what's the purpose of the, the definitions is also very key. And uh, regulatory definitions may also have precedence for a jurisdiction. And, and so that distinction between voluntary definitions and regulatory definitions needs to be um, kept in mind. So ISO is, is a voluntary um, standards organization. And so uh, this uh, distinction of uh, what's the purpose also applies to methods as well. And for those of you dealing with nanotechnologies, uh, you come to understand that, that they can be quite complex because not only do the properties of the materials matter, but also the properties around them. And, and if you look at this in terms of different layers of complexity, uh, you, you know whether or not your particle is of a certain size or whether or not your media is of a certain type, uh, may not always um, matter, but what might matter might be the combination between the size, the media, and the particle surface properties. And then further, if you take that up the complexity ladder, 
you know, if the media properties are changing or, or if other things are being introduced, uh, the complexity even gets even uh, more uh, diverse and, and it's very hard to end with the same sort of con conclusions without very well standardized procedures. Um, you'll see that for, for nanotechnology, when you look at a lot of the standardized protocols and processes, they try to take out these uh, anomalous effects. And a lot of times standards are developed just to be able to compare things uh, because the systems that they need to be evaluated them are complex. So these standards are really essential for allowing uh, for um, materials to be compared and also allowing for uh, understanding of the different effects of materials within different systems. Uh, so it's very important that as you go through and you look at the different types of standards that are available for you know, an intended purpose that you might have, that you look at what the intent of the individual standards are and, and where they're coming from, because this is really key. Uh, there's a lot of standards that are out there for, for nanotechnologies and they continue to grow. And it's important that uh, the ones that you use are indeed fit for purpose. So identifying the right standards is, is essential. Um, and again, is, it must be aligned with, with the purpose. We really have to have a good understanding of what that purpose is. Um, and you know, I use personally this kind of hierarchy uh, just, just to help identify which standards might be the most applicable to a certain situation. So of course, if it's a regulatory, if it's a defined within a, a, a regulatory document or a, a regulation, then those standards should be, be used. Um, if it's an OECD test guideline, um, those also have a, a lot of weight because you can use them in a lot of different places around the world. In terms of toxicology testing and characterization for, for safety assessment, the OECD guidelines are, are really great. Um, full international standards are also another great resource. And, and then there are other types of standards that, that can be applied. When there are no standards available, there are still yet uh, resources that can be used, uh, such as the uh, tiered approach for workplace exposure potentials or even decision frameworks that are provided at the OECD websites. And when in doubt, you can communicate with, with other regulators or stakeholders to decide. Um, just a very quick example of the application of standards in, in industry. Uh, so uh, a common issue that, that, is, is, that occurs is the need to get data for uh, a certain purpose or, or, or a regulation, and you, and you have to compare different contract laboratories. Um, sometimes you'll find that a laboratory might use a proprietary method. Other laboratories might use standards, and how do you know which one is is the best one to use. And there again, you have to look at the purpose of the standards and, and you know, how they're applied and what sort of uncertainties are there. And from that, you can define which standard is the most applicable for your, your purpose. And this is, again, a very important aspect of, of the use of standards in industry is understanding what and, and when you should use them. And just to quickly sum up, it, it's, uh, important to really not only use the right standard, but also get engaged in the standard making process because standards are continually evolving over time and it takes people like you and others to share uh, their needs and, and their experiences to help develop these standards. Um, and the existence of a standard doesn't mean that it's always applicable. So with that, I'd just like to conclude just saying that um, standards are uh, out there for, for uh, different purposes and it's important that you look at those purposes and, and think about uh, participating in the development of standards if, if that's something that, that, that uh, might suit you. Uh, these are very important um, activities for ensuring uh, commerce and, and, um, and, the, and the safe use of nanomaterials. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Scott, for kicking off uh, today's seminar. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Greg Smallward, and he is a member of the Black Carbon Metrology team at the National Research Council of Canada. Uh, he's the Canadian Merit Chair for ISO TC229 Nanotechnologies, and Greg's also a fellow of the Combustion Institute. Uh, he has received a, a bachelor's degree from Queen's University, a master's uh, from University of Ottawa, and a PhD from Cranfield University, all in mechanical engineering. And it's my pleasure to invite Greg to speak about ISO TC229 
Canadian Mirror Committee, as well as Joint Working Group too. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Mark. Let me just bring this up, make sure I've got the right one. Can you see the screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. So again, thanks for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, um, talk a bit about what's going on in Canada um, with nanotechnology standards and, and also connected to uh, ISO TC229. So very briefly, um, these SMC or standards SEC mirror committee on nanotechnologies in Canada, un unusual um, in comparison to other countries, we've got a joint um, committee with um, representation both to the IEC TC113 on nanotechnologies as well as ISO TC229. Um, being a maybe a smaller country, we, we um, join our efforts together and uh, with about uh, 50 experts and members across the country, the SMC tries to address uh, standards development at, uh, in uh, both organizations, ISO and IEC. So our MIR committee is chaired, co-chaired by myself and Gregory Lipinski, who uh, is the co-chair representing IEC TC113. Um, and then by its name, Mirror Committee, it actually mirrors the structure of the um, technical committees that we're working with. So at TC229, there are five working groups and we have five co-chairs. So Mark Tao represents JWG1 on terminology nomenclature. Linda Johnston represents Joint Working Group 2 on measurement and characterization. Brent Bryant, uh, Working Group 3 on health, safety and environment. David Kennedy, Working Group 4 on material specifications, and Roland Hussein, Working Group 5, products and applications. Leah Kamant is a co-chair, um, or vice chair, sorry, uh, representing activities at IEC TC113 across all of their working groups. Uh, so working hand in hand with Gregory Lipinski. And um, so that's the, the structure of our Canadian Mirror Committee. Most of the rest of my presentation is going to be about activities at ISO TC229. And um, just before I get, oops, sorry, I'm having some of the same problems Scott was having. Um, I, I thought I'd describe a little bit about uh, standards development for nanotechnology. Often um, standards document well-established practices, but in the case of nanotechnology, the standards are often being developed uh, concurrently with the science and the products and applications. And so um, because of that, uh, you see the comment here, nanoscience, to take it from the, from the laboratories to a technology and eventually to a product, um, we need to be sure that we can um, measure and identify um, the, the materials or, or, or nanotechnologies we're working with. As Scott mentioned, uh, terminology is critical. And then we, we, we need standards around uh, material specifications um, and both environmental and occupational health and safety associated with these nanotechnologies. Um, moving on uh, for standards development, <laughs> especially when we're doing the standards development concurrently with the product development, as is the case often with nanotechnologies, we, we need people with appropriate expertise to, uh, to work on the development and commenting of the documents under preparation, because it's not always clear what the best method is to standardize. So um, as you can see here, we're asking for expertise we need uh, reference materials and artifacts for um, calibration. But, um, often what we rely on are international interlaboratory comparisons. And um, those are, are used in part to help uh, develop and prove the methods. Um, and then, and then um, also help us assess the uh, repeatability, reproducibility. And eventually that feeds into the overall uncertainty associated with measurements. Um, so uh, you can see here, um, by having science-based and technically relevant standards, um, it, uh, it allows open access to global markets. The way we do that um, in developing international standards is based on consensus. So the, 
the balloting of the documents, the preparation of the documents and ultimate approval of them is based on the consensus opinion of, of the experts involved. Um, and I think um, Scott mentioned the fit for purpose um, and, and that's really what the focus on industrially relevant areas is, is intending to say is, is we do need standards that are fit for purpose and address industry, industry needs. Um, scope of uh, I see, or sorry, TC229 um, tip is, is to address nanotechnologies. So you can see the two bullets here. The key one is um, that, that at least some of the, some of the dimensions of the materials or, or technologies are below 100 nanometers. So that's where uh, definition of nanotechnology comes in. And um, also the materials uh, that are at the nanoscale must have properties that differ from those of the bulk matter or of the atoms alone um, so, so that they can be um, uh, considered nanotechnologies. The um, tasks uh, um, in developing standards, again, um, more or less model the five working groups that we talked about. So terminology and nomenclature, the uh, measurement and characterization, and then um, developing best practices around health, safety, and environment. I will mention that there's 90 standards either published or in development at TC229. So there's been tremendous activity the committee's been in place for about 15 years, so that's a lot of activity in a relatively brief amount of time. Going on, um, this is the structure, and so you can see the five working groups under ISO TC229. There's also the on the left, there's the chairman's advisory group, the uh, coordination group that Scott chairs, and there's a task group uh, as well. Um, at the at the working level, in other words, this is where the um, documents get developed is project groups. Um, and we have experts from e each country um, have the op opportunity to contribute to the development of these standards. The project groups, again, operate by consensus and report to the working group uh, um, that's developing that particular uh, standard. And again, the working groups operate the same way and they ultimately make the recommendations to the uh, technical committee for decisions. And that's that's where the, um, the P members, participating members uh, vote on, on um, any of the projects or standard documents that come forward for, uh, for ballot. So decision-making gets made at the, at the TC level, but it's through this structure that, that uh, everything happens. Um, so I mentioned the NLCG, so there's a lot of coordination going on to make sure that um, the TC229 is aware of activities in other standards bodies, um, because there's, there's often overlap, um, especially with the technology such as nanotechnologies, which is uh, essentially a horizontal platform. Um, so you can see there's a number of other ISO technical committees but there's also um, bodies outside of ISO. Um, VAMAS is um, an organization that coordinates nanotechnology interlaboratory com comparisons for measurements. There's OECD has a working party in manufactured nanomaterials. SEN is a European um, standards body focusing this TC352 focuses on nanotechnologies. I've already mentioned IEC TC113. There's ASTM, the European Commission, and Asia Nano Forum. And this is just a selection of the many organizations that ISO TC229 interacts with. Um, and then um, Canada's got a lot of influence at ISO TC229. The, the five vice chairs that I, uh, that I mentioned um, participate in the working groups that, that they're responsible for, but Eve, even more, um, we've got many, many experts uh, participating in the development of standards. Um, and then at JWG1, Canada actually holds the convenership of the uh, joint working group. Uh, Co-conveners are Bernadette Camaret and Gregory Lipinski, representing uh, TC229 for Bernadette and 
Gregory is with TC113. Um, and the secretary there is Janice Warkington. We've had a rotating member of the chair's advisory group for the last four years. And um, by, by uh, well, there's a rotation every two years we get elected and we can stay a maximum of two consecutive terms. So very recently we've stepped away from the chair's advisory group, but there's uh, every intention that we'll return to that in, in a few years time. I chair a metrology study group within JWG2. And then Canada has been project leader co-lead on a number of projects. Um, I won't go through all of them right now, but um, I think these slides will be available for, for people to view afterwards. But I'll just emphasize again that it's, it's great that we have such uh, interest in nanotechnology and you can see where we've led, uh, led a number of standards under development. Um, maybe the impacts of standards is a good point to address. Um, so very recently, um, there was a standard developed um, on the um, uh, structural characterization of graphene and um, jointly, or um, I guess uh, simultaneously published with the standard was also um, a, a paper in uh, Nature Reviews Physics um, talking about the importance of international standards. And that, uh, that was a really good highlight. And then just very recently, there was another um, publication in Nature Physics um, talking about graphene set standards. And it really illustrates how, um, it, re reading through this document, illustrates how um, taking the, the work of nanotechnology out of the laboratories and thinking about standardization is, is essential in bringing them to market. And in this, um, in this second paper, there's, there's a few quotes that I've highlighted here. Um, and it, the, the last point is, is the key one. It's vital to introduce a rigorous and transparent standard, standardization process involving accredited institutions. And that's really what the sum of this paper is about, is, is pointing out where there's gaps if there aren't standards and how standards help, help avoid those gaps. Um, briefly, I'll say a couple more points about uh, Joint work Working Group 2, where I spend a lot of my time at ISO TC229 on measurement and characterization. Um, there's sort of three different types of standards that are developed, uh, general ones such as uh, um, a technical report on the uh, matrix um, for nano objects that identifies what um, instruments are best for what measure ends. Essentially, depending on what you want to measure, here's the recommended instrument for doing so. And, um, and then also which measure ends are, are best for characterizing nano objects. There's a number of method specific standards developed or under development. Um, so one's associated with measuring particle size. And you can see the, the many different techniques associated with that. A single particle ICPMS to get uh, um, size and number concentration. And then even um, uh, uh, there's a new project on number concentration, a technical report. And then you can see some of these other techniques. Um, I, I won't go into all the details. Finally, material specific standards also makes sense at, at uh, JWG2 because there's some materials that have such unique properties. Um, they need standards dedicated to, to them to describe how to measure those materials. And you, there's a few examples here, carbon nanotubes, cellulose nanomaterials, um, and then graphene and related two-dimensional materials is one attracting a lot of interest right now. Moving on. Um, Here's a few examples of standards. So this, this one was um, looking at uh, measuring size and shape with transmission electron microscopy. And um, it, uh, it was the first international standard uh, uh, published by JWG2. I see marks there, so I think I should be wrapping up. Um, the rest of the presentation really just has a, a few more examples of types of standards that have been developed within JWG2. Um, and I'll skip over those. 
And maybe just at the end, um, just a plea for, for people to get involved in standards development where we would welcome um, any of us, any of the, the, the members of the standards, um, uh, sorry, the SCC Mirror Committee would, uh, would welcome you to, uh, if you have questions about standards projects or if you'd like to become an expert, uh, please let us know. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Greg, for sharing all this information with us. And we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, it's Brian Hayden. And Brian, uh, he has been with the Canadian Standards Association for 20 years. Uh, from 2005 to 2019, he served as the International Secretary for Joint Working Group 1 for um, terminology and nomenclature of ISO TC229 and IEC TC113 and as Standards Development Organization Administrator for Canada's Mirror Committees uh, for ISO TC223 and IEC TC113. Uh, Brian Hayden, uh, now non-practicing, uh, he's a professional engineer in Ontario, and he received his Bachelor's of Applied Science in Electrical Engineering at the University of Waterloo and a Certificate uh, in Quality Assurance at Ryerson University. And it's my pleasure to introduce Brian to give us an overview of ISO TC229 and Joint Working Group 1. Thank you, Mark. Let me just make sure I get this, this slides up. Okay, again, thank you, Mark. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Good day, everyone. Um, I've been uh, fortunate prior to my retirement uh, to have been involved in international standards for nanotechnology technology since its beginning at ISO in 2005. Uh, today, I'll give you give an overview in general about ISO and IEC 229, and then I'll speak about JWG1, the terminology working group. I will try to add to and not repeat what Scott and Greg have already covered. Uh, first, an, an ISO and TC229 overview. Um, ISO, uh, the International Organization for Standardization, is a uh, non-governmental organization based in Geneva, Switzerland, currently comprised of 165 national standards bodies, with member countries participating in international standards development. Uh, SCC Standards Council of Canada is Canada's national standards body. ISO has provided means for multi-country input to develop science-based standards for over a century. Standards in general provide rules, test methods, specifications, management systems, and best practices that are used by suppliers, producers, or regulators, and other interest groups. Uh, volunteer experts from member countries via their national standards body participate in the drafting, review, and approval of standards. Um, ISO TC229 Nanotechnologies is a technical committee of ISO. It was formed in 2005 to develop standards concurrently with ongoing research and at that time very early commercialization. Forming of this TC at that time was proactive versus waiting to develop standards until after products uh, applying nanotechnology became more prevalent in the global marketplace. This new ISO TC began with 14 countries participating, including Canada, with its first meeting held in London, UK in November 2005. A few of us who are still members today on Canada's SCC Mirror Committee to ISO TC 229 had the privilege of being there. At that meeting, the UK was approved to carry the leadership role of chair and secretary for this new ISO TC. 
Three of the five working groups, one, two, and three, were formed at that meeting. Working group four and five followed in later years. National standards body participation from the initial 14 startup country members has grown considerably. TC229 now has 39 participating member countries and 18 observer member countries as of the 23rd meeting of TC229 in November 2020. Uh, as mentioned, there is also an IEC technical committee related to nanotechnology. IEC TC113 is a TC of the International Electrotechnical Commission, also based in Geneva. Uh, TC113 was formed about a year after the forming of TC229. TC113 held its first meeting in Frankfurt, Germany in 2007 to develop nanotechnology standards for electrical and electronic products and systems. Formal liaison between these two international TCs was established to ensure that overlap of subject material, subject matter was min minimized. In fact, two working groups operate jointly, joint working group one and joint working group two. Many liaisons exist too. For example, TC229 has formal liaison for similar subject, subject areas within the OECD. ISO and IEC standards when published are available for adoption by ISO and IEC member countries and IEC member countries following national standards body accredited processes. Alternately, a member country may not carry published international standards through national adoption and instead may use or reference such standards directly where there is value to do so. Uh, one must refer to a country's national standards body for the process followed and for country or region specific practices. As some history, the first standards document from ISO TC 229 was published in 2008 and was subsequently adopted in Canada through the SEC accredited SDO CSA group. It was based on ISO TR 12885 from working group three of TC 229 and was titled uh, Nanotechnologies, Health and Safety Practices in Occupational Settings Relevant to Nanotechnologies. You'll hear more about working group three from Brent Bryant today. Summarizing uh, this overview, uh, considerable progress in standards development has been made by all five working groups of TC229. Uh, the TC229 website now indicates 92 international standards documents published and another 31 in progress. So now I'll move on to speak about JWG1 working group and uh, nanotechnology standards for terminology and nomenclature. Uh, JWG1 uh, is a joint working group of ISO TC229 and IEC TC113. It provides terminology for effective communications and common language and nanotechnologies for testing, classification, toxicity analysis, health studies, and to enable trade. The, ISC, the ISO IEC 80004 nanotechnology vocabulary series, as shown in this list, has been systematically developed via JWG1 to provide basic and complex language for the field of nanotechnology. Over 500 science-based terms and definitions have been defined specific to the subject parts shown here. Uh, reaching consensus among international terminology experts from the beginning was a challenge. Some nanotechnology re related terms were already in general use, for example, nanotechnology and nanoparticle as well some subjects were at their infancy. Also of note is that JWG1 agreed to maintain a hierarchical relationship at a high level for some important core terms. For example, the term nanomaterial. This hierarchy has been closely adhered to where applicable as vocabularies in this series have been developed. Some vocabulary parts in this series provide terms with horizontal application over multiple sectors. For example, vocabularies for core terms, characterization, and nanomanufacturing processes. Other parts focus on specific materials emerging as priorities in research and commercialization, like carbon nanotubes, nanofilms, and graphene. 
Uh, standards documents being developed by the other working groups of TC229 are also, also contributed to identify terminology needs. As well, there are some terms and definitions for nanotechnologies that have been developed by JWG1 outside of this joint series, including terms and definitions for cellulose nanomaterials, as well, new work by JWG1 just beginning will provide terminology for liposomes. And to wrap up, uh, and, and a point applicable to all working groups, uh, just to indicate that standards are living documents, subject to revision to keep pace with science and technology. For example, some vocabulary standards shown here in the series are already being developed as second or third editions. In closing, on this slide is a list of resources for more information uh, with links uh, against each item. Particularly useful is the ISO online browsing platform with free access to view terms and their definitions defined and published to date from JWG1. And as shown last on the list here, I bring your attention to a document published via JWG1 uh, as it is titled, it is a plain language explanation of selected terms from the ISO IEC 80004 series with guidance on basic terminology concepts for core terms for nanotechnologies. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Brian, for all this uh, great information here. And we'll move on to our next speaker, and uh, Brent Bryan. He's currently the Manager of Operations and Environmental Health and Safety at the Xerox Research Center of Canada. Uh, Brent received his master's from the University of Waterloo and has his MBA from Athabasca University. Brent currently serves as the Vice Chair of Working Group 3 of the Canadian Merit Committee of ISO TC229. And he is also the Chair of the Canadian Standards Association Technical Committee for Nanotechnology and Occupational Health and Safety. And he holds more than uh, 10 US patents. And it's my pleasure to introduce Brent to give us an <coughs> View of ISO TC229 working group three. Thank you, Mark. Let's try and start my video here. Um, it's giving me an error on my video. There we go, I think. Okay. And share my screen. Okay, did that come up okay? Yes, it did. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about TC229 uh, Working Group 3. Uh, as Brian said, um, TC229 overall was established in 2005 uh, with current activities divided into five uh, working groups. The scope of working group three in particular is the development of science-based standards in the areas of health, safety, and environmental aspects of nanotechnologies. It's currently under the convenership of the United States uh, under Dr. Vladimir Miroshov and uh, managed by Ms. Heather Benko. Uh, just to give you an idea of the, the spread of the application areas for uh, the different projects that WG3 gets involved with, just a, a pie chart to illustrate that. Um, most of them, as you can see, are, are related to human health, but there's also uh, standards involving the environment, uh, occupational safety and health, product safety as, as well. Overall, there are over 40 projects uh, with 28 publications at present. So just to get an idea of the impact of uh, the WG3 standards um, globally. Uh, we're looking at some of the most requested publications. Um, TR12885 on health and safety practices in occupational settings and 13121 nanomaterial risk evaluation are examples of uh, health and safety uh, type standards. But there's also many examples of which I've listed one here on uh, TR1314 uh, related to more specific toxicological assessments. Um, and also like to highlight, uh, I believe Greg mentioned it also, um, Canada recently co-led 
uh, a project and uh, this document was published earlier this year entitled Evaluation of Methods for Assessing the Release of Nanomaterials from Commercial Nanomaterial Containing Polymer Composites. I'd also like to point out that the first two standards on this slide, the TR12885 and TR13121, have also been adopted by the Canadian Standards Association, Occupational Health and Safety Committee for Nanotechnology. And just uh, looking a little further at some of the impact, um, a lot of ISO standards uh, have been referenced by the World Health Organization, um, both 12901-2 on occupational risk management, applied to engineered nanomaterials part two, and TR13329, preparation of material safety data sheets, um, have also been adopted uh, by the CSA. Uh, in Canada. The MSDS standard in particular is currently under review uh, beginning this year just to ensure alignment with uh, the globally harmonized system. Uh, moving to a more national context, just to give you an idea of, of how uh, standards uh, can make their way into uh, regulation, uh, the US Food and Drug Administration um, has incorporated by reference uh, many ISO standards listed here um, in the Federal Register. And, and one trend that, that you know, comes out a little bit in this uh, is the transition from uh, very fundamental health, safety, and environment standards to very specific toxicological methods uh, intended to evaluate nanomaterials in a timely manner, such as the electron spin resonance uh, method for measuring reactive oxygen species, and also the FTR method for um, uh, surface characterization of gold nanoparticles. Just moving on to some of the more uh, active projects going on in WG3. Um, there's a couple of revisions going on, and, and this is one of the uh, systematic reviews that ISO carries out. Uh, on roughly a five-year cycle. And this is to ensure uh, that current standards um, you know, continue to be relevant. And uh, if any changes are needed, then th these review cycles help uh, address that. So there's a couple projects going on with respect to that. Um, other uh, active projects um, are, are, as I said, uh, moving more heavily into specific toxicological applications. And with more emphasis on um, instrumentation and methods that move beyond conventional in vivo methods uh, as a means uh, to be more cost effective and, and um, rapid product development. So as we continue through the list of active projects, uh, you can see that there are many opportunities uh, for toxicology experts to participate in their development. Um, ISO TC229, like all ISO committees, is driven by volunteers, and new members are always welcome. And just looking at some of the currently proposed projects, um, from the beginning, WG3 has been actively working to produce standards that allow the safe introduction of nanomaterials into commercial use and their safe use in occupational settings. Some of the titles of proposed projects this year continue to reflect this, and also the timeliness of these projects is well aligned with current concerns around new products that contain nanomaterials, such as textiles and respirators, uh, to products that can be used in pandemic protocols. To give you an idea where WG3 is going, uh, I've listed the areas uh, from the current roadmap uh, and uh, so the areas of future work are, are um, uh, span from occupational exposure to nanomaterials to toxicological screening to environmental sound use, uh, product safety, uh, but also uh, expanding to um, the impact of ad advanced or emerging materials uh, and nanomaterial applications related specifically to COVID-19 response. 
I think this illustrates that WG3 is very responsive to changing technology, market dynamics, and a rapidly developing global workplace. So in closing, I uh, thank you for your attention today. And WG3 is always looking for volunteers to help us with the development of standards. It's vital to have a balanced representation between government, academia, and industry. So if you're interested in anything I've talked about, please contact me. Thank you. Back to you, Mark. Okay, thank you so much, Brent. Uh, again, lots of great information. So let's move on to our next speaker. And uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Uh, Linda Johnston, who obtained her PhD in chemistry from Western University. Uh, she has spent her career at the National Research Council of Canada for the last decade as part of the Metrology Research Center. She is now a adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa. Uh, Dr. Johnson is a noted expert on cellulose nanomaterials, and she also serves as uh, Canada's Merit Committee Vice Chair for ISO TC229 Joint Working Group 2. Uh, she's also a Canadian representative on several OECD uh, projects and a member of IUPAC. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Linda, who will give us an overview of OECD. Okay, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you all today. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my slides okay. So I'm going to give you a very short overview of activities at OECD. Uh, and it's interesting to see that the, um, the activities at OECD started at roughly the same time as the ISO Technical Committee on Nanotechnologies. So most of the OECD activities uh, occur under the Working Party for Manufactured Nanomaterials that was established in 2006. And the overall, um, an overall summary of the various areas that this working party is involved with is shown on this slide. So first of all, they're involved in testing and assessment, uh, primarily identifying appropriate methods uh, for FISCAM characterization of nanomaterials. Exposure assessment is the next area, and there they're interested in looking at occupational consumer and environmental exposure. Uh, risk assessment and regulatory approaches is one of the more important areas. Uh, for this working party, and they're particularly interested in being able to harmonize uh, procedures and methods for nanomaterials with existing practice for chemicals. And finally, uh, safe innovation approaches, and so there the goal is to assist authorities uh, to anticipate regulatory challenges posed by nano, and also to help industry to implement a safe innovation approach uh, for dealing with nanomaterials. So um, following the, uh, the formation of the Working Party for Manufactured Nanomaterials, they embarked on a very extensive sponsorship program. And in this program, they uh, undertook testing and assessment of 11 priority uh, nanomaterials. These were all produced uh, by the Joint Research Center uh, of the European Commission. And as part of the testing strategy, they ended up with uh, really extensive data dossiers for these 11 materials. Um, the project ended in 2013, results were released uh, in 2015, and the data dossiers provided FISCAM information, and they also provided a lot of information on uh, toxicological endpoints for the various materials. So subsequent to completing this program, then the OECD Council uh, recommended in 2013 that the regulatory frameworks for chemicals were valid for nanomaterials, but they would need some level of adaptation, and they urged member countries to apply the OECD guidelines adapted as necessary. Uh, this recommendation was reviewed in 2019, and the, uh, the review confirmed that the existing chemical frameworks were satisfactory for nano, but it also identified a number of areas where there was a need for new guidelines and also to uh, modify or adapt some of the existing test guidelines for nano. Uh, the conclusion here was that there was still considerable work to be done to provide a full set of technical tools. And what I'll tell you about in the next few slides then is where they are in terms of completing that work. 
Uh, so in terms of uh, publications, the OECD website, the link is at the bottom here, uh, has some extensive uh, uh, information on the various reports that have been published by the Working Party. And there are, I think, almost 100 of them right now. Obviously, I'm not going to cover 100, but I did want to draw your attention to a couple of recent ones that are of significant interest. So the first two um, shown here, number 90 and 91, uh, present a physical chemical decision framework for assessing nanomaterials, particularly for regulatory purposes. Um, and this really provides a lot of very useful information so that someone who has a specific project in mind with a definite purpose will be able to have guidance to select the appropriate parameters to measure and also the appropriate methods with which to measure them. And Scott Brown uh, was heavily involved in this project. He was one of the project leads. Uh, the other ones that I wanted to highlight are shown on the right of the slide. So there are um, a series of a number of, of publications, most of which came out in 2020, on adverse outcome pathways. And Sabina Halapanavar, who's going to be one of our panelists in a few minutes, was heavily involved as a project lead on these projects. Um, and so the overall goal here then was to link the um, molecular initiating events to biological outcome pathways and to build relationships between these two. So moving on to the uh, test guidelines, which have currently been updated or revised to take into account nano requirements. Um, first of all, there's a dispersion stability technical uh, test guideline, which has been published. And there have uh, there've been three documents that deal with inhalation toxicity. I should point out as well that the mutual acceptance of data, which is really one of the key points of an OECD test guideline and which makes it so useful, uh, applies to the test guidelines, but it does not apply to the guidance documents. So the guidance documents uh, tend to be um, focusing on methods that are perhaps not ready yet for standardization or provide guidance on some of the uh, existing test guidelines. Okay, so that's what's been approved and done so far. Then uh, going forward, OECD is working with a lot of the large EU programs to help develop some of the new test guidelines that are needed. And I wanted to just highlight one or two of these here on this slide. Uh, there is a NanoHarmony project, which was approved in 2020. Uh, it, like many other European projects, has received funding from the Horizon 2020 program. And one of its main goals is to develop and validate test methods for OECD. And they have uh, selected eight different endpoints here that are a regulatory priority. Uh, they also aim to develop a network of stakeholders and to be able to have approaches that translate the science into methods that are suitable for use and regulation. Uh, this came out of the Malta initiative, which aimed to develop OECD, te OECD test guidelines for nano. And their goal really is to ensure that the uh, test guidelines are suitable uh, for use in enforcing some of the new regulations under reach that apply to nanomaterials. Now, uh, the final couple of slides that I have here are over uh, giving you an overview of some of the current projects that are underway. These are at various levels of development. Some are nearing completion, others are just starting. So in the area of FISCAM characterization, there are new test guidelines or documents that deal with particle size, uh, specific surface area, surface hydrophobicity, dustiness, uh, solubility and dissolution rate, and surface chemistry. So these new guidelines really are covering quite a wide range of properties. Just to give you a bit of an idea of the scope of some of these projects, I could highlight that the, uh, the test guideline on particle sizing is nearing completion. It's at the stage of a final draft that will soon be ready for approval by the OECD Council. Um, and this involved an interlaboratory comparison that looked at nine particle sizing methods, seven different nanoparticle samples, and five nanofiber samples. And so to accomplish this huge amount of work, they had uh, participants, I think from somewhere between 30 and 40 different laboratories worldwide. So it really was quite a, a large and extensive effort. Um, in terms of environmental fate and behavior and ecotoxicity, there are quite a number of new projects there as well. So these are dealing with things like biopersistence and biodurability, 
uh, dissolution rate of nanomaterials, removing nanomaterials from wastewater. Uh, there are projects on aquatic toxicity, accumulation potential of nanomaterials, uh, aquatic transformations, and soil leaching. And finally, uh, there's an extensive series of uh, test guidelines that deal with ecotoxicity. And these uh, three of these are now being adapted. The process for adapting them is first of all, looking at the protocol, deciding what needs to be changed for nano, and then carrying out interlaboratory comparisons, which allow you to uh, demonstrate that the methods are transferable and repeatable. So then uh, last but not least, there are human health uh, projects. And these, uh, one of the main ones here is dealing with toxicokinetics. This again is a relatively large project. Uh, it's undertaking, first of all, a data gap analysis, and then it plans to measure uh, toxicokinetics for a number of key uh, nanomaterials, and then use that information to finally come up with some design requirements for how one would carry out appropriate uh, toxicokinetic experiments for nanomaterials. In addition, there's a guideline on uh, in vitro mammalian cell-based genotoxicity underway, and one on determining concentrations of nanoparticles in biological samples. The concentration is really quite important because of course that's needed to really establish an appropriate dose. Uh, and finally, there are document, uh, one document that's being adapted for in vitro skin sensitization testing. So that was a relatively uh, short overview. I hope it's given you a little bit of an idea of the scope of activities currently underway at OECD. Um, in terms of more information, uh, the website for nano safety is actually pretty useful and it has links to many of the documents that I mentioned today. Uh, the Nano Harmony website is also quite useful and it gives overviews of some of the new projects so that you can get a much uh, better idea than I was able to give you today on what exactly is involved in those projects. And then I should also comment that in terms of our um, Canadian participation, there are quite a number of people, mainly from government organizations, who've been involved with the Working Party on Manufactured Nanomaterials. Uh, there is a Canadian delegation which is led by uh, representatives from Health Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada. And there's also a Canadian coordinator for the Working Party on developing test guidelines. And so if you need any information on anything, I'd be happy to try and provide that for you. And thanks for listening. Okay, thank you so much, Linda. And uh, during your presentation, there was a quick question in regards to are these OECD guidelines available for download? And yes, as you can see from Linda Johnson's uh, last slide, uh, they're available uh, for free for download in PDF form. So that's yes, and so the, the link that I gave will tell you where to find the ones that are specific to the working party on nanomaterials, but you can find any of the other test guidelines as well easily. Perfect. Okay, so I uh, thank you so much, Linda. A lot of great information. And now let's uh, we're going to go for the panel discussion, in which we'll discuss with um, three panelists uh, how do these nanotechnology health and safety standards impact your day-to-day -day work. So our uh, first panelist is Dr. Sabina Halapanova. Uh, she's a research scientist at Health Canada and an adjunct professor in the University of Ottawa. And she serves on the scientific advisory board of uh, several European nanotoxicology consortia and has been an active contributor to the initiatives led by the World Health Organization and for OECD uh, specific to nanomaterials testing. And our second panelist is Dr. Primer uh, Dr. Bernadette Primeris. Uh, she's an environmental chemist and she has worked for the Canadian Forces as an occupational hygienist. And since arriving at the University of Alberta, she has been developing techniques for sampling and analyzing nanoparticles. And she is also the ISO uh, TC229 Joint Working Group 1 uh, convener for terminology and nomenclature, as you have already heard earlier in this webinar. And she's also a keen expert on a number of projects in ISO TC229 Working Group 3. And then we have our third panelist, uh, Janice Workington. She's the Director of Business Development for Nano Canada, and she serves as the Corporate Board Secretary. Since la helping launch the organization in 2015, she has built and developed a global network of industry, government, and academic connections that are advancing Canadian innovation. 
She also serves on several committees and is the secretary of the RSOTC 229 Joint Working Group 1 Terminology and Nomenclature. So the next uh, 15, 20 minutes in a panel discussion, we're gonna focus on why are standards so important to you? And I'll, I'll direct the first question to uh, Sabina of Health Canada. And uh, maybe Sabina, maybe from a regulatory perspective, uh, how do all these nanotechnology uh, health and safety standards affect uh, legislation, policy, and guidelines? And I believe you're on mute, Sabina. Oh, can you hear me? I was on mute. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Theo. Thank you very much for this invitation to be part of the panel. And um, thanks to the speakers uh, who did a great job in explaining most of the um, things that um, you need answers to, actually. They have already touched base upon uh, m the questions that um, mm -hmm. you have in mind. Um, but briefly, um, I, I would say that the guidelines or standards really reflect the most um, relevant and reliable testing methods um, uh, that are internationally harmonized um, and therefore aid in safety assessment. So um, in the regulatory perspective, for example, they do inform how a study should be designed, uh, should be conducted um, for the specific um, regulatory testing. Um, again, the, you know, testing in the context of regulatory decisions is so different uh, compared to um, conducting experiments in support of uh, understanding mechanisms or uh, for other other purposes. And so um, that that distinction has to be understood. And um, and the data derived from um, uh, from studies that. Adhere, that adhere to these um, testing standards uh, do support chemical regulation and registration uh, decisions, for example. So um, uh, for to set an exposure uh, standard for a chemical, um, to rule whether a, a chemical in the environment that we breathe in is safe um, to the population. And then if it's not safe, then what do we do about it? So the remediation of um, 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 what to say the the decisions are all based on uh, the study results and therefore um, having a standard way of conducting these uh, studies is really really important mm -hmm. and um, so um, <clears throat> they actually set the basis for um, like i said the regulation of a chemical and sometimes this leads to not sometimes but where necessary as and when um, these decisions lead to policy changes regarding that particular chemical so maybe a chemical may not be any more allowed to be released in the environment if that is found to be toxic uh, based on the studies that are conducted and these studies basically uh, rely on the standards and the guidance provided by the organizations that our previous speakers have introduced us to does that answer your question Oh yeah, absolutely. And obviously there's a lot of uh, work that goes into uh, developing or, and updating these standards and it requires a lot of expertise from around the world uh, to, uh, to develop and uh, update standards. And obviously a lot of expertise also not just comes from government and industry, but also academia. So my next question is directed to uh, Bernadette. And, uh, and, and why is it so important for like uh, people such as yourself in academia to be involved in standards development? Um, so the reason why it's important, uh, so I'm an occupational hygienist, I'm an occupational health and safety specialist. Uh, I work a lot, in my research is in uh, uh, exposure assessment and um, outcomes, health outcomes. Um, so in terms of hygiene itself, um, I think it's important for, her, for us to develop proper uh, methods uh, for sampling, collecting proper samples, um, and then analyzing these samples uh, for exposure assessment to nanomaterials. Um, so far, um, the amount of uh, ISO standards on that subject is quite limited. I think uh, JWD2 has the one on uh, carbon black and nano silica, uh, but it, these are very complicated, and we need to test also different type of samplers, different type of methods. Um, we also need to be aware that the fact that um, uh, the industry will do that type of analysis if it doesn't cost much money, it's complicated. Um, the hygienist in the uh, field won't be able to run that kind of, of assessment either. So I think it's important for academic to do that because the, the private sector 
um, doesn't necessarily have the money to do that kind of uh, um, uh, development. Uh, and we have uh, access to laboratories where we can uh, do experiments and repeat them. Uh, we have access to students that can uh, uh, help us do a lot of work. Um, the other thing is, I think it's important also is because of the students actually, because we need, I'm training the future occupational hygienists. Um, a few of my students are now occupational hygienists uh, for various companies. Um, so it's important for them to know that they have to use standards because uh, according to the law, um, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, you actually have to use standardized methods um, to collect uh, and analyze your samples. So um, they have to be knowledgeable about the standards um, and the standard uh, association. They have to be knowledgeable about the, uh, uh, the access to resources, uh, things like that. So, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Sorry. The other thing is the occupation, the development of occupational exposure limit for nanomaterials, which is mm -hmm. also in the process, but uh, we don't really have any, uh, at least in Canada, we don't have any occupational exposure limits for, let's say, carbon nanotubes right now. Um, there are some recommendations in the States uh, done by NIOSH, but uh, that's about it. Okay. Yeah, and obviously you mentioned about the private sector and industry. There's a lot of innovations going on in the in, in the in Canada's nanotechnology industry. And um, I definitely, uh, I guess the next uh, question is directed to you, Janice. And I know you interact a lot with industry stakeholders. So, like, uh, like what's Canada's uh, nano Canada's important role with standards development and nanotechnology and health and safety? Yeah, and I think with from an industry perspective and hearing from our industry stakeholders, uh, our job is to communicate the importance of looking at standards right from the beginning of developing a new product or a new material and understanding that it's important to look at what uh, you know is happening in the international standards community um, and how that can save you money right from the beginning to have that to have that knowledge and that know-how. And so uh, us being at that table and me having the privilege to sit on the joint working group one is I can hear firsthand from experts and know what's happening and know what the hot topics are and what people should be looking at. And we translate that communication back to our, our industry partners and our members across the country. Um, and we really encourage industry to get involved. It's important to participate. And like we've all heard Scott said at the beginning, you know, and Brent, everybody I think has really done a call for industry participation in the, in the standards development. And I think it helps, you know, remove trade barriers. It helps save money. It helps keep your, you know, in, industry employees safe. And I think that's what we all want in the end. And how do we keep communicating that well and, and showcase the importance of having that engagement and participation in these in these standards organizations. Yeah, and uh, definitely there's a lot of innovations in uh, the Canadian nanotechnology sector. So obviously there's gonna be uh, uh, new nanomaterials being developed and produced and that in turn would canvas out to some, you know, new potential health and safety concerns. So um, the next question is, uh, is directed uh, for Sabina and, and uh, obviously a big part of any uh, companies uh, uh, considerations in regards to marketing a uh, specific uh, nanomaterial is like the, the, the potential toxicities of all these uh, different nanomaterials. So again, I, I understand that a big part of your work is to study and review the different toxicology of nanomaterials. So what advice can you give to these uh, stakeholders? Like what, 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 what should they do in regards to, uh, uh, to you know, how to determine the different toxicities of these materials? So, um... I don't think I can advise because the advice comes from these standards, I would say. Okay. They have the recommendations and the guidance there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I do conduct a lot of toxicity studies to understand toxicity of uh, nanomaterials, um, but mainly for understanding mechanisms. However, um, the data that we collect from so-called um, studies that are, that are in adherence to these guidelines are we refer to them as gold standard or reference data sets. These are usually time and resource int intensive experiments and um, we cannot repeat them many times. And so getting it right the first time is really important. And the guidelines and standards help to achieve that. And in my own case, for example, even though I'm not 
conducting an OECD uh, uh, test um, assay or OECD uh, study, uh, so to say. Um, in my day-to-day -day toxicity um, studies, I do apply them to simply get that little detail about what is the specific toxicity model that I would like to use um, to assess or measure a particular uh, toxicity endpoint or what should be the duration of exposure for my, for my nanomaterial or what should be the animal strain that I should be using in my experimental design. Um, and also some uh, more, all the guidelines also include um, details such as number of animals to be used and what are the type of tissues and how they should be processed and how they should be harvested, etc. So I think when we, when we have one study conducted according to this uh, guidelines and guidance and, and, and the data is quite, um, what to say, um, rich, uh, one thing, and also because like you mentioned, um, these guidelines and guidance documents are put together by experts from various fields from all around the world, um, and they are updated um, as and when there is new scientific evidence, so they are current, they are based on the current scientific knowledge, and therefore uh, following these studies uh, would allow the regulators to use the data with confidence um, because this is reliable um, and reproducible kind of data allows them to have cross comparison across the studies as well as cross species and um, it also allows them to um, reduce uncertainty in their in their decisions etc so i think that's the main purpose why one would use um, OECD, uh, OECD guidance in, in conducting a toxicity study. And like Linda in her, um, in her talk mentioned about the 2011, um, the sponsorship program uh, that looked at 2011 or 2006 sponsorship program that included 11 different nanomaterials which were tested according to the OECD principles, OECD guidelines. Um, and so the data is actually um, usable in support of regulatory decision making. I don't know what type of data is there, but yes, that can be used uh, readily for the uh, reg decisions. So I think um, um, apart from that, I would say that um, following this kind of, like I said, I mean, getting it right for the first time is, is good because then it allows us um, uh, for focused resource allocation and it lessens duplication um, and like I already alluded to, it, um, it allows us to do cross comparison um, and increase actually more, more than import, more importantly, it increases confidence in the data generated and use and makes it useful for uh, important decision making in the regulatory context. For sure, and yeah, just definitely lots of great uh, information and resources found in all these different nanotechnology health and safety standards. And the next question I'm going to direct it open up to all of you. Uh, so, in your opinions, uh, what do you think are the current gaps and challenges in using and applying all these nanotechnology health and safety standards in Canada? Um, who wants to go first? Uh, Bernadette, you want to go first? Uh, sure. So the my main problem as a hygienist is the standards method to collect and analyze the samples. Um, mm. uh, so that's that's and the other part is the lack of occupational exposure limits. Um, yeah. So it's it's extremely difficult for uh, I think for hygienists uh, right now in the workplace. Yeah. Um, to to make recommendations, so the the only thing they can have to is like quali uh, uh, qualitative uh, assessments, control banding, and this, and things like that that they can use, uh, because they don't have um, they don't have real methods and uh, standardized methods and uh, occupational exposure limits. Um, so that's the the I think the biggest challenge right now uh, in uh, occupational health and safety uh, for my colleagues in the in the, the industry um, I have to say that I, I just received a research contract because to measure carbon nanotubes in a, a pilot plant because they couldn't find anybody that was able to do it so they came to me okay and then uh, Joanna so what, uh, what, what do you think are the current gaps and challenges in using and applying all these standards 
Well, from our perspective as Nano Canada, I think awareness and understanding of how all of these organizations work together, the joint working groups, you know, the groups that, you know, the coordination groups and how everybody's coordinating and working together. address some of these issues and to talk about what's important, what's happening in Canada, and how to have information sessions just like this to address, you know, it's not, it, all the information is out there. You just have to know where to go and look and try to present that information in a clear and concise way, which I think all of our, our speakers did such a great job today, and to really have these conversations and just point to where to look. Where can I find this information? Who can I talk to? And I think that's an important first step, but it's something we've identified as a gap for sure. Okay, well, we'll get to that in a, in, in a minute. And uh, maybe Sabina, what, what do you think are the gaps and challenges in Canada? And... Um, you know, I think one of the speakers mentioned this or um, just to state that most of these guidance documents and standards are put together by volunteer scientists. So this is volunteer work, which more than often people do during the evenings, during the weekends, you know, just before going to bed, like just put some work there. Um, and they most of the times reflect consensus of those people who are involved. And so if you want to broaden the scope of this, then there has to be active engagement of broader communities. More than often, these committees have uh, limited um, limited, what to say, prescription in the sense, um, few people from an organization are able to involve themselves actively in these activities. And therefore, what's in guidance, uh, apart from what's, apart from the science, uh, the current science, it also reflects sometimes the expertise around the table as well. And so expanding that expertise is very important to have a little bit broader scope and broader perspective. Um, and all, I think more than broader, broader perspective, different perspectives, um, because toxicology is evolving. And as we know that OECD guidelines, for example, are based on um, animal studies. Um, now toxicology field is moving into the in vitro, non-animal um, testing strategies. Um, of course, there is a lot of work that's going on to put together the guidance guidelines for in vitro uh, tests and assays, but we are not there yet. And I think um, mobilizing people in those directions, having active participation from wider community is really, really important. And I think that will help uh, broaden the scope as well as I guess somehow attract new people who like this new, um, who who are more interested in using new strategies and new um, uh, test systems than these old traditional animal studies, which take two years to finish, for example. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm yeah. personally- not So, yeah, I, I have, uh, yeah, I have uh, less than a minute and I, I do want to squeeze one quick question to all of you. And it's a tough one. Can you, if you can only pick one nanotechnology related health and safety standard that you think stakeholders that you deal with would find useful, which one would it be and why? And uh, to limit it to a short answer because I'm told to end it uh, this uh, panel discussion session. So anyone want to go on and try to answer that? Can you repeat the question? Okay, if you can only pick one nanotechnology health and safety standard that you would recommend to stakeholders, uh, which one would it be? That's a tough question, Mark. A you tough have to question. Pick one. You have to pick a favorite. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then, if if no one wants to answer, then uh, again, uh, thank you so much for all of you, uh, Sabina, Sabina, Bernadette, and Janice, for a very uh, informative uh, panel discussion on why nanotechnology health and safety standards are are relevant to you. And I'll hand it back uh, over to Marie for the concluding remarks. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark, for leading the panel discussion and for putting this great program together. Uh, J'aimerais remercier aussi uh, tous les uh, uh, tous les membres du panel ainsi uh, ceux qui ont contribué 
Euh, pour leur générosité, le temps qu'ils ont passé à, à nous transmettre leur connaissance. I wish to thank the audience as well, and, and we look forward to bringing you more webinars in the future. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to join us on October 21st for our virtual launch event. This is the launch to our international conference that will be held in June 2022 in Edmonton. And you can find all of the information on the nanocanada.com uh, site. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today.